Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV in what has been quite a quiet week, but it's for various reasons, life's got in the way, but there'll be more shows coming your way next week and I'm planning lots of content throughout April and May. But anyway, we're off to the Philippines again, which has always proved popular on this channel. Robert Esparel is a historian, author and educator, a retired Marine with experience uh, living and working across Southeast Asia, including the Philippines. Today, he is sharing the history of one of the resistance stroke army units in the Philippines. So I'll bring him in now. Good afternoon, Robert. How are you today? Great, Paul. Thanks to be here. I really appreciate the invite. So um, as a new first time guest, I like to ask people kind of how they define themselves as a historian, researcher, analyst. Obviously, as a retired Marine, you've kind of got a vested interest in that part of the world. But do you have a label that you particularly like? Um, so I, you know, I am a military historian. Uh, I taught history at the Naval Academy. I did traditional uh, straight military history. But uh, as I've grown, I mean, I've, I've expanded my aperture a bit, you know, they call new military history, the the look at not just the battles, but you're looking at the the people, the economics, the society, all those things. I, I think those are very important um, to pull into a, a you know discussion of, of warfare because it's not just uh, uh, battles and tactics. Um, but I'm also a military scientist. And so uh, I try to use my, my time, particularly uh, I, I was a doctrine chief at Special Operations Command, and I teach there at Joint Special Operations University. So I try to bring in the principles of uh, resistance uh, into military history as well. So uh, kind of an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. Brilliant. And a silly question, but it, I'll ask anyway. How important is it to have traveled to some of the areas you write about? Because there are historians who, who do all their work based on archives and, and, and never really go out in the field. But you have traveled extensively across and worked across. How how important is it to have, to have walked these places and understood the cultures and the background? It's it's uh, now I'm not going to say it's a, it's a requirement, but as you're as you're writing about things to get that perspective on the ground. Um, you know, places in the Philippines that I've been where like resistance happened on this island and you get just a better feeling of what it was like uh, in that region. You know, my, I cut my teeth on the Battle of Iwo Jima. So, you know, unless you're on top of Mount Suribachi, which is like the Mecca for the Marine Corps, you know, unless you're there, uh, you don't really get the same perspective. And so um, uh, I would encourage uh, all historians to get out there if they can yeah, well, indeed. I mean, obviously, people can't always travel, but for those who can, it's always something about boots on the ground. But anyway, you've come armed with a PowerPoint. Folks, we'll kind of do questions as we go along. Um, we may raise the kind of idea of what resistance is and who are the who are the resistance against and some of the terminology and things like that as we go along. But I'm going to hand over to my guest to take us through this, uh, this fascinating topic. Great. Well, this first slide, Paul, is just to kind of emphasize um, that irregular warfare was really pervasive in World War II, and I know you've covered a bunch of it in your show, um, but uh, most most audiences think of uh, World War II as this huge conventional war, and it was, you know, uh, industrialized uh, powers with armies and navies and air forces, but it also included a pervasive irregular warfare fought around the globe. So. There's five major irregular warfare theaters for the, for the United States. Indochina, uh, Burma, China, France, and the Philippines. Um, and each of those is, is, is different how the uh, America approached each one. Four of those were organized and executed by William J. Donovan mm. in the Office of Strategic Services or OSS. And then one was coordinated by Douglas MacArthur in Southwest Pacific Area Command. So we're going to do a deeper dive into that. But, you know, as you see on these four theaters here, the OSS was in Burma, um, establishing resistance uh, uh, and guerrilla uh, frameworks uh, against Japanese occupation. Uh, that was Detachment 101, uh, particularly with the Kanchan peoples in the mountains near the border uh, with Chiang Kai-shek's Nationalist China. That region is still a hotbed of resistance uh, today, so uh, it has a long history there. Um, in China, lesser known but really important, uh, OSS Detachment 202 worked with the Office of Naval Intelligence to train guerrillas against uh, Imperial Japan. This was a massive endeavor. This was a really huge effort. There's a great book on this topic by Mao Chin Yu from the Naval Academy, which I highly recommend if, if you're interested in that. Um, in Southeast Asia, OSS Detachment 404 worked with the British 
to train and assist guerrillas against the Japanese throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, and they also had a detachment to support Ho Chi Minh's resistance to Japan and Vietnam, uh, which is kind of ironic, right? That's a big ironic piece that we supported him during World War II. But probably the most famous uh, unconventional warfare campaign in the war was fought um, you know, in, in France, the French resistance. And the OSS partnered with the British Special Operations Executive to insert Jetberg teams, so three three-person teams, to marry with French um, agents and organizations. Um, the Jedburgh program became very popular and eventually included the insertion of uh, teams all around Europe, not just France. Um, historian Will Irwin from Joint Special Operations wrote about, an yeah. essay about this, which I, I recommend. Yeah, great book. And by the way, we are going to be covering those operations uh, on World War II TV towards the towards June, uh, with one of the debates being how you say the word, because Jedburgh, Jedburgh, uh, there's a, like like so many of these other um, terminology, there's there's different ways of of, of, meant, of, of, of pronouncing it, but um, we will be tackling that as we goes on. But just a quick question for you about the OSS, whether you better answer or not, I don't know. And Andreas is asking... How many people worked for OSS by the end of the war, specifically in these in these theaters? I mean, it's it's going to be thousands, isn't it? Possibly. Yeah. Thousands. In comparison to the massive um, forces of the Navy and the Army and the Air Force and the Marine Corps, the OSS was quite small uh, and very selective. Uh, but they they really had a broad appreciation for um irregular warfare and they brought in real experts to do that most of the many of them weren't military folks they'd bring them in like you know if they want an ethnologist or someone else they just bring them in and put a uniform on them so and they were also they you know they had a, a very diverse uh personnel including people with disabilities um virginia hall is very very famous yeah. but you know she had a prosthetic leg uh and i think there's over 30 um agents working in france which was kind of a close-held secret for for a long time uh, after the war. So they they employed a lot of women. And when when you think about that, when you're looking at undergrounds, you know, having a military-age male walking around, uh, not in a uniform, stands out right away. <laughs> so you need to like have have folks that blend in, because um, anyone who's military age is is part of those vast armies. So um, they used a lot of great great folks. I don't know what the total number is though. Okay, well, no problem. But back to you. All right. Um, so uh, Southwest Pacific area. This was the area of command that was set up um, when MacArthur lost the Philippines, right? This is his new command. Uh, it's the fifth major region where the U.S. employs unconventional warfare. Uh, OSS tried to get involved here. Uh, they contacted MacArthur. They wanted to get agents into Man uh, Manila and start uh, working on uh, resistance, but MacArthur specifically told them to stay away and to stay out. I mean, you could kind of see that with his personality. He wanted uh, every he wanted to control everything going back in and and uh, reinvading the Philippines. So, Southwest Pacific Area uh, Command managed support resistance from Australia, uh, a large part from Northern Australia, including Darwin. So. Um, they had two major efforts, uh, particularly at the beginning. One was collecting intelligence and figuring out what was going on with resistance movements in the Philippines, which they didn't, really didn't understand. Uh, also, what's happening with the Japanese. But then they began supplying an army and equipping the guerrillas, uh, which became a major effort. So on uh, this map, on the right side of the screen, you can see some of the intelligence agents' insertions into the Philippines. Uh, during insertion or extraction of agents, these activities were often accompanied by clandestine submarine operations, which over the course of two years delivered 1,500 tons of support. So quite a lot of support going to resistance elements. Submarines also delivered radio equipment and operators to use and maintain those systems. The communications personnel were Filipinos trained in Australia. The map on the left side of the screen shows the communications net developed by 1944, which was quite extensive. Um, and you can see that it doesn't uh, go all the way up to Luzon. Luzon is really the contested space mm -hmm. with the Japanese because that's the only place the Japanese have enough force to try to really uh, control. So uh, the radio net's not, not really developed there till, till uh, 1945. All right, let me go to the next slide here. So we'll talk a little bit about geography. Um, 
the Philippines is just such a hotbed of resistance, uh, which surprised <laughs> the U.S. Army at the time. So I want to explain some of the reasons why uh, the Philippine Islands geography is a, is a big part of that, right? Um, there's over 2,000 inhabited islands. Uh, you can count up to 10,000, depending on who you're talking to, as, as, as actual islands there. And over the many decades, each of these islands developed a very independent spirit. Uh, numerous peoples migrated to the Philippines over thousands of years, so they have a number of racial groups that are integrated there. And this uh, resulted in distinct mixtures of various ethnicities on each of the islands. And although fiercely independent in spirit, sea trade and intermarriage between people spread some commonalities in the region. So uh, there is some sense of a unified um, desires in the, in the Philippines. But the number of languages developed remains, remains extraordinary. There are over 100 major languages and 10 major ethnicities in these islands. And additionally, there are many religions. And although Catholicism is in the Luzon area, uh, is prevalent. Islam in the Mindanao area is also prevalent, as it is today, still a point of uh, friction and contestant, uh, contention in, in the islands. But bottom line, uh, woe to the invader of the Philippines. Uh, and mm. and I, really, I really say that emphatically because uh, this is not the place you want to invade uh, unless you want to face resistance. Um, it hosts practitioners familiar with resistance methods, both nonviolent and irregular forms of Violence, and that's really how. Uh, I know you, you asked earlier about how do you define resistance. Um, yeah. I, I define it along a spectrum. And there's five types of resistance. There's nonviolent legal forms. There's nonviolent illegal forms. There's rebellion, which is short in duration or in size. There's insurgency, where you're using your your military force to try to put it down because it's so pervasive. And then there's belligerency, where it looks like it's a civil war. Hmm. So. Um, I, I, I span all of that in resistance. There's a quote um, by the Hukbalah resistance leader, Louis Tarouk, on this slide, which I think encapsulates Philippine uh, resistance potential. Tarouk states, the most significant fact about the Filipino people is the strong tide of revolution that runs through our history. It has broken over the surface in over 200 recording uprisings and revolts against tyranny. Sometimes they were against a foreign oppressor, sometimes against tyrants of our own. The masses of our people have never been submissive. The revolutionary spirit is our proudest heritage. Mm. Yeah, when you asked about, you know, going places and, and what it, uh, the difference it makes, you know, in Manila, um, if you go to their, their uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the capital, they have a, um, they have a, uh, um, a park, a national park. And in the park, they have like these statues of resistance leaders, right? Starting from, uh, you know, uh, from the initial uh, conquistadors of the Spanish all the way through to modern times. And it, it really is kind of a national idea of resistance, uh, particularly the foreign invasion. So um, mm. they, they share that, that heritage. Do we know whether the Japanese had done any kind of intelligence gathering about the various places they're going to be expanding into? I mean, the Philippines, Malaya, Burma, about whether or not the various peoples are likely to show a tendency for resistance or did, did the Japanese probably just not care? I'm, do, do we know anything about that? So a little known fact is that um, during the American-Philippine War um, in, in 1890, 1898 through 1901, the Japanese actually had liaison officers with the Philippine army. Um, even in the early 1900s, they were looking at the Philippines as a place that they wanted to have influence and, and control over. So um, that, that, uh, that effort by Japan never, never stopped. Uh, they were um, very close to um, Philippine uh, parties. So there was like uh, nationalist parties in the Philippines, some, Actually, most Filipinos were nationalists. They wanted to be independent. But some of them thought that American support would get them there, and some of them thought J Japanese support would get them there. So they did that. Um, the, the, the Japanese actually tried to use the Catholic Church to a great extent um, to try to get better appreciation for the Philippines. So they used um, their bishops and their priests from southern Japan and sent them down to the Philippines to try to 
replace uh, the mostly European uh, priests. Um, so part, part of what, you know, as they see, like they're ex expelling the Europeans from Asian theater, uh, which sounds good, right? You know, it sounds like it's something that the Asians might get behind. Um, they they kind of drank their own, own Kool-Aid a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most Asians were not happy to see, you know, uh, their oppressor replaced by a Japanese oppressor. oppressor. And so um, the U.S. had a really good history uh, following uh, the war in building up uh, a really good relationship with Filipinos. A little known fact is that the second highest literacy rate in Asia in World War II, number one was Japan. Number two is the Philippines. And that's mm -hmm. because Americans came to the Philippines in large numbers as teachers, and they uh, made English pervasive there, which really helped as a glue between the Filipinos because they had so many different languages. And they, you know, they, they, they'd be damned to, to speak the other islands, uh, you know, language, but they, they'd be happy to speak English to, to each other. So it still serves as kind of a glue there. So um, we had deep ties in the Philippines and, uh, and, and there, there were a lot of uh, 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 nationalists that supported Japan, but uh, there was a huge resistance to them as well. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Philippine resistance. I've got this slide here. It's got a nifty map for you uh, that I made to show, show the different resistance movements um, in the Philippines during the war. You know, when MacArthur lost the Philippines, that's the largest defeat in American history, by the way. Um, what was his defeat at Corregidor. Um, so when he comes back, you know, really uh, in shame to Australia, he is overjoyed to hear about these reports of resistance and, and uh, in some, in some ways tried to claim credit for it. Like, like he had, he had somehow, uh, you know, thought of this, but he didn't, you know, I mean, this was just the innate uh, culture uh, of the Filipinos to resist. Um the, most of, of these uh, movements were Filipino in composition. This is another piece that looks uh, wrong when you read history because most of the history written on these movements are by some of the Americans that were yeah. in the resistance, right? And very few are mit written by Filipinos. But of the 70 major uh, armed resistance groups, the, the majority of those are Filipino only in composition. Uh, in addition, uh, there is shadow governance in many places around the Philippines. And shadow governance is just governance by local folks who are not um, in compliance with uh, the, the puppet gov government of the Philippines or of Japan. So they're, they're administering themselves, particularly in, in regions where the guerrillas um, have some type of uh, control over territory. This, this type of um, shadow governance is, you know, kind of grows up. And there's dozens of in intelligence organizations all over, uh, including Manila. I mean, Manila is a hotbed for intelligence. It's just crazy <laughs> how many intelligence groups are moving in and out of Manila uh, because each of the major um, uh, resistance movements wants to have a touch point in Manila to figure out what's going on. So there's this cross pollination of very a lot of agents, including U.S. agents coming in and out of Manila. Um, and there's also just support. Well, you know, we call that auxiliary support, but there's support to these resistance movements throughout. You know, the people who are providing rice, or they're providing water, or they're helping with medical care, or they're helping with um, education or, or other things. You know, there's just folks around who help resistance movements because they're Filipino, right? And so they side with with the folks that are that are near them. You know, the photo on the right side of this slide are guerrillas from Luzon Guerrilla Army Forces. This was a unit that was led by an American, uh, Robert Latham. So uh, if you haven't covered that yet, I'd love to cover that with you uh, some other time. We can do that. Yep. All right. Okay. So the hook bullet hop are, are, are really different uh, from the other resistance organizations, primarily because they have this great advantage of having deep roots in nonviolent legal and nonviolent illegal forms of resistance going back until the 1920s. Communist organization began in 1924. It's part of like this global communist uh, movement uh, and it becomes official party called the PKP in 1930. The PKP proved attractive, particularly in central Luzon. There's a 
what's called the central Luzon plain and they grow rice there. So like many uh, Asian cultures, you know, the, the rice growing peasantry is kind of being held hostage by landowners and even the Catholic church um, and not really getting a, a, a large share of the, of the rice. Um, and so they find this communist ideology very attractive. But in 1930, the PKP is immediately banned. So, so uh, as soon as they rise up, they get crushed by the Commonwealth um, government, which is underneath U.S. control. Uh, so the communists form a number of front groups. That's also very prevalent around the world. Is is creating a front group for your for your communist uh, cadre. Uh, three of those are listed here. So the the KPMP were mostly rice farmers who did sharecropping on Luzon. You have the AMT. There are also uh, rice uh, farmers from the same region. So these are kind of two competing uh, um, groups in the same place. And then uh, and then you have the uh, KAP, which is a little different. It was a labor union. So this was an attempt of the socialists to try to get, you know, some, some folks from Manila involved. And those were those were mostly uh, members of Manila. So, so yeah, go ahead. So a quick question for you. Uh, living as I do in France, you know, you can't help but almost make life of Brian jokes about the various French resistance units in 41, you know, the Judean people front, the Judean front of, you know, it, that they're all kind of claiming similar names, but they're pulling in very, very different directions. Th these, you know, you've given examples of these movements. Are They're obviously, they're separate, but do, are, do, are they team players? Do they work with other organizations, units, or are they all very single-minded in their focus? I think uh, most of these groups, uh, on the socialist communist uh, scale uh, are not not competing with each other. Right. So although, you know, because, uh, you know, communists uh, are ideologically driven, there are there are seams and gaps, which will, pour, will, will, you know, put one person of a certain ideology in one camp or the other, but they believe in a common goal. And so on the bottom there, I see the one, two, three, you know, in 1941, when when the Japanese invade, they immediately unite. And they create the united front. So, um, yeah, they they understand that they're out for a common goal. They want to have the Philippines free and independent, and and they want a nationalist uh, country. They just want it underneath communist ideology. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the Hukbullah. Let's finally get to the Hukbullah. So the united front establishes the Hukbullah. So this is like their armed component, right? So they're 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 taking their their uh, political organization and they're organizing uh, deliberately a military one. Um, in English, this is the People's Army against the Japanese. So it is primarily focused so specifically to defeat the Japanese. Uh, the shortened Tagalog version of their name is Hukbalahap. I won't even try the uh, the longer one. Uh, some Americans, in particular, call them Hook for short. The map on the left shows the regions where the Hukbalahap operated during the war. Um, the intellectual underground of the United Front, uh, you know, those three organizations, that really remains at Papanga. Papanga is like the, the you know, the, the capital of the of the, of the, the, the central plain for the, the rice growers. So um, that kind of becomes an intellectual capital for a lot of communist um, ideologues. But the Hukbalahap military headquarters normally operated around Mount Ariat, and their flag simply resembles the global trend at the time. So it's very simple, you know, red with a hammer and sickle. All right, so here's their organization. Um, like a good communist movement, uh, they operate as a committee. So they don't have a, um, you know, one, one Stalin uh, figure. They're really trying to, to do it right. It's also... Uh, it's not Filipino culture to not um, be collaborative with others. So the committee framework is very, uh, it works very well for Filipinos who are, have a diverse um, ethnography to kind of have a consensus-based decision, decision making. Members of the committee constantly changed, but normally consisted of prominent military or intellectual leaders. So, you know, this committee will move around uh, different members into the committee really based upon who's the most prominent at the time, right? Or who's being more, more, most successful at the time. On the left side of the screen, you can see a photo of Larisse Tarouk, one of the members of the committee. 
As stated earlier, one of the advantages of the Hukbul Hop was their two decade experience in resistance prior to the war. I mean, this is this is this was good for them. Now they didn't have any military experience, so this is a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because most of the folks who go into the Hukbul Hop are not prior military; like they're learning from from scratch, which um, makes it painful for them the first year in particular. Every leader went by an alias and not their real name. All of them had an alias. Um, uh, Tarouk's was Juan de la Cruz. So Juan de la Cruz r- roughly translates to common Joe or common man, right? This is this is what mm-hmm. you call a common Filipino is Juan de la Cruz. So it's really a clever uh, uh, alias for him, right? It, and it fits his uh, ideology. The military committee had four subcommittees. There's the Barrio Unit Defense Corps. Uh, these are like home guards. They're mostly called home guards in most of the resistance movements. And it's kind of like a, 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 a militia uh, network within um, uh, controlled cities and barrios. But they also did shadow, shadow governance in those places. I talk a little bit more about this um, a little bit later. They had a Department of Intelligence. Uh, and this was an elaborate network throughout Luzon uh, and extended into the Visayas as well. And then it had many touch points in Manila, um, which to be successful, you really had to have a few agents there. And then the procurement section leveraged auxiliaries, and these provided taxes, food, equipment, you know, all the things that, that the guerrillas need to operate. And then there were five regional commands, which made up the area complex or the operational area for the hook the law. And those are all, all indicated there. All right, the squadron. So... The base organization for the Hukbul Hop was a squadron. This unit could be as small as 80 people or as large as 200. You know, it didn't have a set number behind it. Um, and for most people, when you look at, at this organization, uh, it looks like an infantry company, right? I mean, this is, this is a standard infantry company framework. The only exception is that you have this political officer, right, that's embedded into the staff. So the political officer, like most communist uh, uh, political officers, they're there to correct the ideology and provide training for the for the uh, soldiers and, and make them good communists, you know. Um, so all Filipino guerrillas identified with and followed a charismatic leader. So even though some of these squadrons had numbers behind them, like, you know, Squadron 103, most of the members uh, did not use that term. They would just say, I'm with so-and-so. This is my leader. So it was very based upon, um, you know, a local leader. And that's 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 who they followed, right? So you, they, you weren't able to take the, the Hukbul Ha, uh, weren't able to take one leader and replace him with another. That's not how these organizations work. Uh, it was all local. It also gave some of these squadrons the leeway to switch sides. You see a lot of um, Uh, squadrons or battalions moving between uh, different uh, resistance organizations throughout the war based upon whatever the the wants or desires of the squadron leader really were, you know, what was happening in the battle space. There's only one unit uh, that swapped out guerrilla unit leaders. Uh, So there is an exception, and that's the Free Pinay Guerrilla Forces. So I'd love to talk about them. They're probably one of the largest and most pervasive uh, units but they did do that purposefully uh, during the war. Okay, we just had a question uh, earlier about uh, relig- religion. Uh, yeah. James said, um, no, that's not the question. I- I've got the one, where's the one he asked? It's, uh, were they Christian? They be- and then Rick Green, who's also lived in that part of the world, he said that um, it's a good question, James, because communists often are atheists. So did was there kind of a separation of kind of church and state within these organizations? Uh, the early Hukbul Hukbul Hop did not um, directly uh, uh, force conversion, but uh, they were antagonistic to the Catholic Church. Like I said, the, the, the Central Luzon Plain was owned by landowners, most of them in Manila. A, a large part of that were, were, were owned by the Catholic Church, right? And wow. so their propaganda uh, about, hey, you know, Everyone should be equal. You should own your own land. All that stuff directly opposed uh, the Catholic Church in some sense, opposed Catholicism. But there wasn't an attempt like, um, you know, those more um, 
more powerful and uh, successful organizations like in China, um, you know, even Mao Zedong, he didn't erase all the 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 the, the peasantry's uh, native belief systems till he had full control, right? So I think that's that's kind of the same same uh, idea here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so in organization, if you had two squadrons, you'd make a battalion. So that's how you'd have a battalion organization. And then if you have more than two battalions, that's a regiment, you know, it could be two or more. And then uh, these area commands that, you, that we saw previously on the other slide, they kind of act like a division headquarters, right? But they're, they say division because it, that means something to a military person. And, it, and if you say you have five divisions, that's, that, that looks like you have a huge organization, right? Uh, so they use that term, but they're really like an area, area commander uh, with, with certain geographic space. Thank you. All right. So you can't talk about the Hukbala Hop without talking about the Chinese uh, communist movements because they're really integrated um, both in the battle space and in terms of ideology. This is a global war and the conflict in China between nationalists and communist China is happening throughout the diaspora uh, in the Pacific. So uh, in great parity, there's four nationalist Chinese resistance organizations uh, during this time period, and I don't cover those here, but there's also four communist um, uh, uh, resistance movements in the Philippines, um, and they're, they're, they're in line or supporting the Hukba Uh I, I've listed those organizations on this slide. The most popular is called Wachi. Uh, Wachi worked directly with the Hukba Lahap and sometimes acted as, as advisors. Uh, I, I don't have enough information to know if these these folks directly came from China, but they did have contacts in China, and um, they were they seem to be um, much more educated in the art of war uh, than Hukbala Hop were, uh, particularly at the beginning. Like I said, they, it was a steep learning curve for the um, these these you know uh, political movements to kind of become an armed organization. Okay, propaganda. So like in every uh, communist organization, propaganda is huge, right? Uh, it, it facilitates recruiting and, and keeping uh, members uh, in control and making sure that um, they stay within um, your membership. So from its legacy as a social movement, um, the Hukbala Hop neatly understood the importance of propaganda and they used it you know, from day one. It utilized several printed sources to spread its me message. Um, I've listed both the Tagalog and the Mandarin prints, prints on the right side of this slide. However, it was the example of the individual communist guerrilla that the Hukbala attempted to leverage as its best advertisement. So they spent a lot of time ensuring that soldiers um, took good care of the population, paid for things instead of stealing them, um, because that was their ambassador, basically. Uh, so they, they tried to focus their efforts in making sure that the soldier was the best representation of, of their communist ideology. On the left side uh, of this slide, it's a depiction of a female communist leader. Unlo unlike most guerrilla uh, factions in the Philippines, the hook made little distinction in the recruitment of male or female resistance uh, members, resulting in the employment of some very famous heroines. One leader named Philippa uh, Kalula was more popularly known at, by her alias, Diang Diang Diang. So like Juan de la Cruz for Taruk is a great name. Diang Diang is this very powerful nickname because it goes back to this Muslim princess who fought the Spanish in the South, a uh, very famous heroine. And so she took on that, um, that nickname and it, it became uh, very, very powerful her, for her as a person. Um, one hook described Kalula as a huge woman, very masculine in appearance, with a rough and commanding personality. Most men were afraid of her. She feared nothing. Uh, very early in the war, Kalula became perhaps the most famous gorilla in all the Philippines. Um, this was in March. As before the, before the uh, fall of Purgador, she was already fighting the Japanese. Uh, she had some of the members of her uh, squad were, were taken captive um, by the Japanese and some of the Philippine constabulary. 
And she uh, went and rescued them by force. And then as the Japanese and the constabulary followed her to try to get the prisoners back, she set up an L-shaped ambush and killed all of them, right? So like just, really, you know, really ballsy, right? Like she, mm -hmm. like she, she, she had a lot of, a uh, lot of grit. Um, so uh, some scholars refer to fe the, these female uh, uh, communists as Amazons for opposing traditional economic and social norms. And one scholar estimates as many as 10% of the Hukbalaha were, were females. Hmm. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we can ver <laughs> verify that well, but that's what she estimates. All right, so uh, like all guerrilla organizations, um, they're organized for violence. That's what they do, right? So the Hukula use violence for political purposes. They use force to occupy towns and barrios. So, you know, they were coming whether you liked it or not. They held public trials for local leaders who collaborated with the Japanese or if they just opposed the Hukula, right? And then they'd be executed. Um, they would establish the Barrio Unit Defense Corps. Right. So the Barrio Defense Corps was this new organization where you would take folks, normally folks who had been disenfranchised um, from normal uh, political power, put those folks into a Barrio Unit Defense Corps kind of headquarters where they manage and govern that that town or Barrio. Uh, and then they would use that to um, they'd also use the BUDC to do education, indoctrination all those things, and then also to, to harvest the resources of that town to support the army. Um, with viol violence against uh, other armed groups, you know, establishing territory resulted in pitched ba battles. I mean, it just had to. Um, there's a lot of different resistance movements in the Philippine constab Constabulary and the Imperial Japanese Army, all fighting for control of these areas. And so the Hukbalahap, would, would attempt to avoid fights with the Japanese army, but uh, sometimes it laid ambushes or it conducted a raid or even tried to stand its ground at times, um, which which would not be a long affair. I mean, they're, they're not as well armed as equipped as the Japanese, but particularly during the rice growing season, um, the Japanese army was coming into the Luzon Central Plains not all the time. They didn't they didn't want to occupy it all the time, but when when rice was being harvested, they would come in to try to take all the rice. That was what was feeding their army. And at times uh, the hook would, would um, oppose them. Um, the Philippine uh, constabulary learned early um, to avoid fighting the guerrillas. Uh, so most of the Philippine constabulary did not fight guerrillas around the islands, uh, except for the hook blob. They did not like the hook blob. So there are, uh, instances of fights between the Hukbalahap and um, the uh, Philippine Constabulary, much more so than, than the other guerrilla groups. Um, part of living life as an illegal resistance member was that local citizens either supported you uh, or they se secretly ratted you out, right, to the Japanese or the Constabulary. So identifying the, the folks you couldn't trust was a part of every guerrilla uh, organization, every resistance organization. And so, of course, you know, force violence was used to, you know, coerce and to execute those who um, who opposed the Hukbalahap. And then finally, uh, the Hukbalahap, as it expanded its territory uh, in the rice growing regions and beyond, it would encounter other guerrilla organizations. And so uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but they did uh, have a lot of contests and fight with other guerrilla um, organizations in the Philippines, particularly those that were led by Americans. Right. All right. So here's the next slide and kind of get into this a little bit. I've got uh, those in green are either neutral or friendly with the Hukulahop and those in red, uh, you know, these guys are, are, are killing each other. So um, the Hukulahop did have friendly and neutral relations, right? So they're not just isolated by themselves. We talked about Wachi earlier uh, in the other communist organizations. They, they were definitely friendly to those organizations. Uh, President Cason's own guerrillas, which is a really awesome case study, <laughs> in which uh, I, I, I'm, I'm writing a book, and this is one of the chapters in the book, so I'd love to talk about it. But this is all uh, purely Tagalog organization, um, and it, lists, it lives mostly south of Manila. That's most of its area, so it doesn't have like a territorial um, um, problem with the hook. Um, 
So there's not a lot of violence between the two. In general, the Hukbalop do not really choose to have violence against other Filipino-led organizations, right? They that's that's not uh, that's not in their ideology. You know, they want to convert them, they want to keep them on their side, they want to be friendly with them, um, but they're not trying to uh, have violence with them. Uh, Hunters ROTC was another unit that you know was neutral, I guess, to the Hukbalop. These are Philippine. Um, College age uh, students, for, for 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 the most part, at least the leadership, um, they they formed out of the ROTC units, and uh, they had interactions with the Hukbalop, but they weren't violent. So, in contrast, the Hukbalop had very uh, violent relationships with Luzon guerrilla army forces, in particular. I mentioned Robert Latham earlier. Uh, th these folks had knock knock down, drag out uh, fights and ambushes. Um, both uh, LGAF uh, and the Hook, the Luzon Guerrilla Army Forces and the Hook competed for the same territories, right? So uh, they were, it was inevitable that there would be conflict between them, between them. And most of the constabulary and a lot of the American-led guerrilla uh, army forces were, uh, were, were made up of and had large contingents of veterans. They had folks who had served in the Philippine army or the Philippine constabulary prior to the Japanese invasion. Uh, and so they didn't like communists, you know, this, this, this wasn't what they, what they liked. And so they were just innately, uh, against them. Uh, and sometimes there's instances of both the Philippine constabulary and the guerrillas helping each other out by going on a raid on the hook. So they, you know, they could agree to, to do that. So, um, there, there was, there's also claims of, of atrocities uh, and reprisals against the two. I won't, I won't get into it here, but um, there are, are some claims of, of some extrajudicial killings between the two. All right. So my last slide here. Uh, I'm going to use a, a methodology developed by U.S. Army Special Operations Command and John Hopkins University to try to do an analysis of the Hukbalah, hop, right? You know, how, what do we make of this, right? So uh, we're going to use five factors here. We're going to look at actors, causes, environment, organization, and actions. So in terms of actors, the leaders who commanded the hook, the hook transformed their approach to resistance from nonviolent legal, nonviolent illegal, rebellion, and insurgency. And they did so multiple times over three decades, um, which, is, which, is, which is evolutionary and pretty powerful. Uh, initially in the 1920s and 1930s, prominent communists and socialist politicians, they behaved as reformers, right? They're trying to change from within uh, the Philippine uh, governance. Through these struggles, communist and socialist leaders garnered an exceptional amount of experience in mobilizing people prior to the war, particularly the poor. Um, and, and they included in a lot of uh, ballot box uh, votes and uh, three major rebellions that happened in the 1930s too. So uh, they were very, they had that background, like I said, it was very powerful that they had that prior to the war. Uh, historical accounts have focused on Louis Tarouk as the leader of the Hukbalahap, and he certainly was following the war, but during the war, he was not. You know, he was the leader of the, um, or the, the most influential on the military council, but it really was the military council that was was running things. It, it was more of a consensus-based decision-making. Um, rather than a top-down hierarchical organization, the Hukbalahap acted more in a Filipino tradition of consensus-based decision-making. Um, and this is also ex exhibited by the fact that they would rotate members in and out of the council, right? So. Uh, some some members would would their time is up, uh, and, and and other times they they bring in someone else. Most of the regional commanders were also on the council, so you could see as as one group got more powerful, they would they would get more representation. Um, unlike many Philippine guerrillas, the Hukbalap merged female representation and leadership throughout its ranks, including on the council. Uh, uh, um, that that included uh, Kalula. She was on she was on the council at, at some point during during the war, um, and this appealed uh, with with uh, uh, you know changing uh, the social network to to really be more accommodating to females was a great uh, propaganda move 
for them. It was great for recruiting. Uh, it was very smart. So in terms of internal and external support, the Hookable Hub consisted of both full-time members in the armed component, but this was backed by a large number of part-time supporters in the rice growing farmer base, and they acted as auxiliary. Many, uh, if not the majority of the farmers on the central Luzon Plain supported, or at least proved sympathetic to the Hukbala Ha. In fact, in the Philippines today, there's still folks who are sympathetic to the Hukbala Ha. They, they really, uh, they might not be communists, but they really um, look with, uh, uh, you know, admiration uh, at their resistance. Um, less than 10% of the Hukbala Ha or the, the communist movement was armed, trained, and equipped for combat. Uh, not not a, a problem with organization, but they just didn't have the weapons. And those weapons that were coming in from MacArthur weren't going to the, the hook. Uh, but they they did show a great uh, resourcefulness in, in, in getting those weapon systems, a lot of them which came from uh, Bataan. So they, they went to Bataan, which was a, just a huge battlescape of destroyed weapon systems with uh, all the battle that occurred there between the Imperial Army and, and MacArthur's uh, forces and harvested a lot of resources there and, and fixed weapons. It was, it was very resourceful. Uh, in terms of allies, the Hukbala Huk had direct relations with communist movements in other countries, particularly in China. Uh, although most of this support during the war simply consisted of liaisons and membership uh, uh, mentorship, you know, just that type of thing. There, there really wasn't a lot of traffic back and forth uh, during the war, but there certainly was before with, uh, with the United Front and other uh, groups. Causes. So as far as a cause, undoubtedly the communist ideology served as the backbone for the Hukbalik cause, but it also exposed nationalism, which was very prevalent in, in the Philippines at the time, uh, in opposition to both Japanese and American occupation, both before, during, and after World War II. So they wanted foreigners out. Um, the spirit of communism around the world was also uh, a great uh, uh, call uh, to, to arms and to action for the Hukbala Hop. So they, they were able to harvest that. Um, at the same time, the lofty ideals of communism proved difficult for individual squadron leaders to comply with. So communism did not run, it ran converse to the way Filipinos normally do business uh, and it had some, had some problems. Filipinos normally work on a system of patronage, right? So you, you, you have loyalty because you take care of the folks beneath you. And so to do that, you harvest a lot of resources for yourself, right? But this communist ideology was against that. Like you're not supposed to, uh, you know, get resources for yourself. You're not supposed to take them from others. It had, it had an ideology that really wasn't, you weren't able to do in, in real Filipino tradition to keep the loyalties of your, of your soldiers. Um, so the realities of guerrilla bands who often resorted to banditry to get uh, what they needed, right? Either taking rice or taking weapons or taking whatever they could, uh, ran, ran counter to communist ideology. Um, Phil, Philippa Kalula uh, was actually executed by the communists uh, because she, uh, which is really sad, but she, um, you know, her she had the power and control from from her, her forces through the system of patronage, which just ran different from the way that uh, communist ideology wanted uh, wanted that system to work, um, and so uh, she hit the glass ceiling, I think, in some sense. Um, okay, environment. As was in the case in the communist movements of China and Southeast Asia, the Hukbala Hop sought grassroots support of disenfranchised poor. In the case of the Philippines, this primarily was the farming class on the central plains. So these farmers created great wealth for landowners who lived other places. So these, these were easy recruits, right? Easy to pull in. And in that area, they, the Hukbala Hop were very popular. They, they were able to capitalize on the economic situation to get them. But as the hookah look expand, they're growing outside the rice growing region. They're not very popular. You know, the folks in those regions do not uh, uh, hold sway with this type of communist view of I'm going to take all your property and give it to everyone else, right? These folks <laughs> like the system they're in. Uh, and so in some ways, their ideology confined them, right, to this one area in central Luzon. 
uh, and that they couldn't really expand far outside of it with much support. All right, in terms of organization, um, I think you can best describe the Hukula Hub as a mass organization, but it also has uh, aspects of an elite front. Um, the, we talked about the trade unions and socialists uh, in, in the background of, of, uh, of the history of the hook that was very powerful. Um, it created trade craft. These folks, because they were communists were persecuted prior to the war, they had secret uh, methods. They had all the trade craft to work as an underground. It was very powerful. Uh, through the Barrio Union Defense Corps and the number of, of areas that it controlled, it may have had up to 500,000 uh, folks uh, that were affiliated with the Hukula Hub. Uh, most of Americans, like the CIA, would put that around 100,000. So I'm not sure where uh, where they're at, but but it was a very large organization, particularly during the time. So I put the carrot and stick there for actions. You know, the, the hook, they used the carrot. You know, they wanted to get folks into the organization and they didn't want to, you know, treat them poorly, but they used the stick too. I mean, if you didn't, didn't uh, do uh, business the way they wanted it done, they used violence and death. Right. That, that's how they uh, kept control. So um, those were their two primary uh, mechanisms that they used. Um, they used different methods for funding and procurement. They even tried to co cozy up to MacArthur at some point uh, in late 1944, hoping, hey, we're your friends. Give us some stuff. We can see the writing on the wall. Uh, uh, MacArthur didn't fall for it. Right. So uh, they never did get get. Um, support from Southwest Pacific area. So if you were gonna criticize the Hukla Hub in hindsight, you might think, hmm, that was a, that, that maybe maybe should have changed your policy or done something different. Maybe you could have gotten some support from MacArthur uh, if, if, if you made different decisions, maybe not. So in conclusion, let me get to my last slide here. I know I've been talking way too much. This is a very famous uh, picture uh, of, of propaganda for for Philippine gorillas, and I know you had that on uh, on the on your uh, advertising. Perfect. Program. Yeah. The hook blow up have many lessons to offer uh, in regard to success and failure of a resistance movement. It demonstrates the importance of maintaining a long term political strategy, right? Evolving over decades and employing a flexible application of all types of resistance. World War II acted as a catalyst for the hook blow up, in which it leveraged the the Filipino tradition and grew its organization. Um, uh, but like I said, it was really limited by geography and its ideology. So after the war, it tries, it, the Hukbalak Rebellion uh, emerges and it tries to fight the new uh, nationalist uh, um, uh, government to, to make a communist one, but it's really doomed to failure. It's too, isolated in terms of its ideology and its uh, its geographic base to expand to the desires that it really was trying to uh, trying to do. That's all I have, uh, uh, unless you uh, have any questions. We have quite a few questions been building up, um, which is great. So um, I'll just take them kind of in no particular order. Um, Chris is saying, did General MacArthur consider arming the Hucks in an effort to fight the Japanese? The enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing. So um, MacArthur's command mostly tried to communicate and get intelligence from Americans who were in guerrilla units. One of those was Bernard Anderson, uh, who was to the south of uh, the area we're talking about here. Bernard Anderson was, was pro give give the give the hook some some weapons right he, whether for right or wrong whether he misread the situation or not uh he did think they could be useful but uh in the end uh i think southwest pacific area was too smart to see long term where's the philippines going after this uh you know who can we trust and um they never did uh share arms and equipment with the hub Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have some, there's some more. Uh, Peter O'Connell asked, uh, like the Germans in Europe, did Japanese security forces have any success infiltrating the resistance groups or even attempt to? So the, the Japanese, like I said, they kind of drink their own Kool-Aid. They really thought that the Philippine Constabulary, which is like a puppet uh, government or puppet police force, would be able to suppress uh, rebellion or insurgency 
within the islands. Um, they had military police forces, which are very famous, that would work with the Philippine constabulary to collect intelligence, to do torture techniques and other things. And, and, and they, were, they were very effective, but the Philippine constabulary was ineffective. And so without getting a Filipino face out in front uh, of the Japanese, they really couldn't infiltrate. Now, they did do some infiltration. Uh, they, they, they did find some spies and collaborators to, from which to use, but most resistance organizations survived by finding those folks, folks first and using extra, extra legal uh, killing to get rid of them. So um, that's, that's just the reality of working as a resistance movement. And it's not something that's covered underneath their international law. <laughs> But if you want to survive in that type of environment, um, these these are the things that try to try true methods of doing that. So, um, you know, in in Filipino tradition, if you showed up as a Japanese as an outsider, no one really would support you. They might support someone who was that was pro Japanese that was Filipino. They might uh, work with that type of person, and so the Japanese tried to do that, but they uh, they failed to do it to any great extent. And and also as as the, the guerrilla movements became more successful and more well-armed, the Philippine constabulary did not want to go out and die fighting other Filipinos. They, they're just trying to get uh, uh, Japan and America out of here, right? They're, they are uh, grass between two elephants is a Chinese mm -hmm. expression. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and Scott Grimwood, kind of follow-up question about the Philippine constabulary. Uh, are they made up of Filipino supporters of the Japanese primarily? So uh, when the the Japanese, when they stood up their puppet government, the, the puppet government there, uh, I'm using that term puppet, puppet, not because in a bad sense, but so you understood what I'm talking about. The puppet government that the Japanese stood up, they control the Philippine constabulary, right? So the Japanese expected that, that the government that they had stood up and their forces would suppress rebellion. Right. Um, but it, it didn't work. And so near the end of the war, the Japanese started training um, uh, their own units of Filipinos to go out and fight, but it was just too late. It was too late at that point to, to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. And then going back to the earlier, when you set up the organization of these units, Scott also asked, what would happen when a guerrilla leader was killed? Was a replacement selected how, how from within? Yes. So... Uh, there are instances of guerrilla guerrillas um, assuming leadership through through a murder as well. <laughs> okay. So I mean, uh, there's no ground rules here. You're an illicit organization working in the underground. Um, okay. So uh, yes, uh, they would select from within. Uh, and like I said, the Philippines is a communal society, so it's uh, it's not like a Viking society where you can just kill the leader and then you take over. Uh, you would have to have the, the majority of the folks support what you were doing uh, or they wouldn't follow you, follow you going forward. So there was a dyna, dyna, dynacism of, of how those organizations worked. Um, the American ones were a little different, the ones with American leadership. Uh, they, they, they worked a little bit differently. But in the, the Filipino ones, uh, definitely it was a communal uh, discussion, uh, more, more of a consensus based. Okay. And then following up about the kind of committee type organization, uh, Ian Carr is saying, did the committee type organization of these military units, this is, I, I guess, is extending beyond the unit you're talking about today, uh, prove catastrophic, catastrophic if people are captured and tortured by the Japanese? You know, in that if everybody knows kind of a little bit about what's going on, that could present lots of dangers. Yes. So that's the cellular network that they were really good at. So uh, the purpose behind a cellular network is that, you know, if you know, say you have an arms cache, if you're, if you've got an arm cache in a, in a field, uh, and you've got another one, you've got seven different arms cache in fields. Only one person would know where their arms cache was. You wouldn't know where all seven was that way. If you had somebody get captured, then they would only be able to lead the Japanese to one cache. They don't know where the other ones are. The same network existed within the committee. So no one knew where Louis Taruk was. You know, there's only a few people that knew. And then, you know, you wouldn't, wouldn't share information. Uh, uh, and even the members of the, the military committee today, I'll be honest with you, it's hard to figure out who they are because they use these, code, these, these aliases, these code names, 
and they they followed them into their civil war that they did or their insurgency with the Philippine government later. And so you never know who these folks were, even uh, even after the war, if they went back into the uh, underground or just went back into the, the regular population, they would keep that part of what their life was secret. So they they knew these things for 20 years prior to the war and they were really good at it, much more so than a lot of the other guerrilla organizations, which was true. They would get infiltrated. Um, they weren't as good as that at the beginning. And sometimes uh, there, there were, uh, in fact, any, any military officer that was a colonel that was left in the Philippines, they all got caught and they all got executed, right? Uh, they weren't good at, at, at doing this organizational leadership from behind the scenes, right? Right. Okay. Thank you. And then the last question, which actually is going to be a massive great rabbit hole that could take us another hour because it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big one from Andreas who's saying, what happened to these collaborators after the war? But to me, that brings up the whole question of, what is collaborator? What is resistance? What are the aims of these various organizations? What are the aims during the war? The aims become different afterward because you said earlier there's the, the movement towards uh, independence. So um, I remember we did the show uh, with the lady from the Philippines about the, the, the uh, is it the, Mac Palette, Mac the, the collaborators and very, very few were brought to trial. So is it very complicated? I mean, a daft question. It was obviously very, very complicated after the war. Exactly who was who? So President Kasson prior to the war begged for the Philippines to be independent. Oh. Everyone knew that there was going to be this big fight between Japan and America. And you know what's right in the middle of that? The Philippines, right, yeah. which is American controlled. So following the war, um, there was blanket, blanket, blanket amnesty for anybody who collaborated. That's how the Philippine, Philippines uh, was able to uh, pass through this because it wasn't your fault that you were supporting America or supporting um, Japanese uh, interests. It was their fault for being there, right? right okay. so, so they they just purely took a nationalist, nationalistic view on this and that they were the victims uh, in this contest between two powers and they gave everyone amnesty. Now, the Hukbullah Hup decided to keep fighting, so no amnesty for them. Until later, uh, they, they, this is a, a great a technique of trying to get your your insurgents to quit. It, mm -hmm. Of course, there were uh, calls for amnesty for folks who would, would drop their guns and come in. Um, but the Hukbullah didn't want amnesty. They wanted uh, they wanted they thought and they were powerful. They were they had a very powerful position uh, in the in the Central Plains. But like I said, it was limited, and they didn't really realize that or acknowledge that. And so when they went up against the, the rest of the Philippine islands uh, or the nationalist government, the Tagalog government, really, uh, they got crushed. Okay. Then, and then my last question is going to be, um, where are we now in understanding resistance, quote unquote, in the Philippines? I mean, I'm from my age group, I remember seeing those films, you know, Back to Bataan with John Wayne, Anthony Quinn. There was those ho lots of those sort of homegrown Filipino movies in the 60s with an imported American star, George Montgomery or something. So now we've got the understanding of the Chinese involvement as well. We're understanding the makeup of various different motivations of the of the Filipino base in it. So I'm assuming if we haven't sorted out France after 80 years, there's a lot of work still to be done in the Philippines. Is that is that fairly fairly true? Uh, I've spent the last four four years of my life <laughs> right. going going down uh, and and uh, trying to sort this out. Um, and I and I I would think I'm probably going to be at it for another uh, six or seven years. So there there are. Um, great sources to get after this. One of those is at the MacArthur Memorial. There's a uh, archive there. Uh, it's full of all the intelligence reports from Southwest Pacific area. Um, and one of the ironies of uh, following the war was when MacArthur staff tried to give this to the army um, and say, hey, here's all, all our here's all our material that we learned from the war. Are you going to put it in the, in the army ar archives? They looked at it and said, there's no tanks and planes. I don't want it. And so that's why all that stuff arrived uh, in Norfolk, uh, Virginia, is uh, it's all in this um, back room where hardly anybody goes to see it. So I, I've spent some time in there uh, getting through all these archives and then trying to catch up with a lot of new scholarship that's been done and scholarship that's been done in the Philippines as well to try to get a better idea of how diverse these organizations were 
Um, and they're all so different. It's so fun uh, to, to, as an historian, to really learn uh, more and more about how these, these movements uh, operate. And that's what I will spend probably my life project in, uh, in trying to flesh out. Well, that's a nice um, historian's answer. You know, it's complicated, it's nuanced, there's work to be done, but clearly there is work to be done on this and um, and you're the man to do it. And as we'll be returning to this subject in the future with you and other people from the Philippines. So it's been a great, um, uh, uh, if not raising more questions and answering some of them, but they're, they're the best kind of presentation, the ones that, you know, there's it's complicated. So I'll invite you back in the future to expand on this. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Paul. And, uh, yeah, it's been great fun. So, folks, I'll see you all again next week. Two shows on Monday about submarines. Other shows, Dan Ellen is back. Talk about um, RAF Bomber Command again. But anyway, it's all going to be lots happening next week. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rob. And I will see you all again next week. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.